Episode 10, August the 21st, 1914. Our Troops Reach Mons, A Great Moment of History, by Georges Lecoq, curator of the Mons War Museum, read by Gareth Williams. Monsieur Georges Lecoq, who, with Monsieur Léon Pépin, founded the War Museum at Mons, has a unique story to tell. For, as a boy of 14, he was in the garden of his house when a British cavalry patrol was first sighted. These lancers were the earliest British troops to be welcomed by the Belgian inhabitants of the suburbs of Mons, and Monsieur Licot describes in thrilling fashion the scenes of enthusiasm which their arrival evoked. Friday, August the 21st, 1914. A glorious summer's day, blazing with sunshine as if nature were intent on revealing all her splendour. The civilised world, in a torment of anxiety, turned its gaze towards that ancient land of Belgium, where, once again, the destiny of Europe was to be decided. Already, the eastern half of the country was under the heel of the enemy, and King Albert's little army, after having waged a lone struggle for eighteen long days against an enemy a hundredfold stronger in numbers and material, was withdrawing slowly upon the fort of Antwerp. At Mons, capital of the province of Hainaut, close by the ancient battlefield of Malplaquet, where the Duke of Marlborough had won fame two centuries before the war had not yet made itself felt, and the inhabitants awaited anxiously to know their fate. From early morning, alarming news had spread from mouth to mouth. Brussels had been occupied the previous evening, and Hulan had been sighted at Manage, some sixteen miles northeast of Nantes. The Garde Civique had been on a war footing since the beginning of August, and was holding the bridges and crossroads on all the highways leading into the town. This force, corresponding in some degree to the French Garde Nationale, or the English Yeomanry, was composed of men who had not served in the army. Armed with Comblain single-shot rifles firing a leaden bullet, this car could not be utilised in wartime, except for service in the rear, because of its obsolete equipment. The Garde Civique, only active in peacetime in the towns, assembled every Sunday on the parade ground or at the rifle range, and these displays were either a relaxation or an imposition according to whether the citizens who took part in them were martially or peacefully inclined. The manoeuvres invariably ended at the café, where a few pints of good Belgian beer put everybody into high spirits. On that particular morning, however, a company of the Garde Civique of La Louvière had come to reinforce that of Mans and occupied La Bascule, an important strategic point at which the roads from Mans to Binon and Charlois and to Givry and Beaumont crossed about a mile and a half southeast of the town on the northern slopes of Panizel Hill. Sentries had been stationed all along these roads and were conscientiously scanning the horizon whilst their comrades made themselves comfortable and slaked their thirst at the Bellevue Café. Suddenly, I had noticed about six or seven hundred yards away a cloud of dust approaching swiftly along the Beaumont Road from the southeast. Indisputably, it was caused by galloping cavalry. A few seconds later, I could clearly make out lances and khaki silhouettes, wearing flat service caps and galloping at full tilt. The sentry missed no detail of this. He hid behind a big elm tree, loaded his rifle and waited. Who could these strange horsemen be, armed with lances and coming from the direction of the Ardennes, but German Hulan? They certainly were Belgian lancers, and I for one was not aware then that the French army included any regiment of lancers. The sentry methodically took aim with his rifle. In another few seconds, a shot would have rung out. 
Suddenly, the horses stopped dead, the leaders drawing up on their haunches, but the riders did not dismount. Seeing the sentry, they waved their caps, shouting, English! English! The sentry, somewhat reassured, beckoned them and aroused the company. There followed a fine commotion. The guard civiques were instantly on their feet. While some officers who knew English were trying to talk with the dispatch riders, others gave orders. Company fall in in two ranks. Slope arms. Present arms. In a few minutes, all the nearby inhabitants were joining the guard civique in welcoming our allies and offering them cigarettes, eggs, chocolate, fruit, beer, and so on. Never shall I forget that moment when we first knew for certain that the British troops were drawing near and were going to fight the invader for our soil. Our two eyes were hopelessly insufficient to admire the martial glamour and magnificent equipment of our allies. The leather rifle buckets, the ropes and pickets for tethering the horses, and above all, the bags of corn rations, were subject to high price. The horsemen, still in the saddle, seemed in a tremendous hurry. Having asked the way to Aubourg, they rode off again amid vociferous cries of Vive les Anglais! Vive l'Angleterre! raising their hands to acknowledge the spontaneous welcome which had been accorded them, and shouting Hurrah! in honour of Belgium. As a precaution, an officer of the Garde Civique escorted them on his bicycle to Aubourg, as much to show them the way as to ensure safe convoy. After twenty-four years, I cannot recall whether these horsemen belonged to the 9th Lancers, 2nd Brigade, or to the 5th Lancers, 3rd Brigade, but I can swear to it that they belonged to one or other of these units. I have dwelt upon this event which I witnessed because it gave us inestimable encouragement at the very moment when we needed it most. Two days later, I also witnessed the gallantry of the British Infantry, 8th Brigade, General B. G. C. D. Doran, which then consisted of the 4th Middlesex, 2nd Royal Irish Regiment, 1st Gordon Islanders, and 2nd Royal Scots. For all day, on August 23rd, they resisted almost alone the brunt of the attack by the 9th German Corps in the Mont Salient and on the heights of Panisail and bois I pay equal tribute to the King's 15th Hussar who fought in the same part of the line in the capacity of divisional cavalry, and to the 6th, 23rd, and 49th batteries of the 40th Brigade of the Royal Field Artillery. Let me add my most cordial greetings to those old contemptibles who fought in the ranks of either of these units. I assure them that the civilians of the district where they fought for the first time in the Great War have never forgotten, nor will they ever forget the sacrifice they made. Oh, my God.